So thank you for joining for this kickoff and introduction to, well, I really should say the continuation of emissions reporting season. Um, you were invited today because you're a part of our global emissions subscriber group, and we're so glad that you can make it. We had some great success with this over the last year and making these live updates to you as opposed to everything being via email. So your feedback was awesome. I know Adam and Juan heard very, very positive reviews from it. So that's why we have continued back into our 2022 version. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Annabelle Munson. I'm your host and moderator today, really here just to help assist Juan, uh, Adam, Rick, and Chris get you some essential info. So let's get to our agenda. What are we covering today with the emissions team? So we're gonna go over emissions compliance calendar and key deadlines, uh, all the necessaries for UK ETS and EU ETS. We're gonna put a spotlight on current activity in global emissions, uh, establishing these AOHA re registry acts, the 2021 AE reporting, flight activity review, data consolidation. We'll go through a reporting and offset, reporting a carbon offset breakdown, step-by-step, we're going to hear insights from our reporting partner, AES Limited, via our special guests, Chris Johnson and Rick Cordes. It's really good to have them back with us again. And looking into that crystal ball, we're going to consider, again, what's new and what's coming uh, in the emissions and reporting world. Finally, like I just mentioned a moment ago, we are definitely going to be answering your questions live, so have those ready for us. Okay. Uh, as always, a lot to cover. So we're going to go ahead and get our introductions out of the way. So starting, of us, starting us off today, we're going to have Juan Munez with our Global Regulatory Services team, Adam Hartley, our manager, Global Regulatory Services, and then joining us from Europe, where we have our special guests, like I mentioned, with Aviation Emission Solutions, Chris Johnson and Rick Cordes. Cordes. So welcome all. And I'm going to go ahead and spotlight our speakers, each one, as they come up on the, on the docket. So look for them on your screen. And Juan, if you can go ahead and get us started, we will be on our way. Thank you very much, Annabelle. And uh, good morning and afternoon to all of you. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we do have a lot of information to cover, so I'll keep this brief. Uh, as Annabelle mentioned, I'm Juan Muniz. I assist Adam here with all our global emissions uh, services. So uh, just going to cover a very high level of what's going on uh, currently and what to expect in the future. Uh, so right now, as many of you know, we're currently in the middle of the 2021 reporting for both uh, EU ETS uh, and UK ETS. UK ETS being very new to all of us. Um, you know, they started their own emissions uh, program after Brexit, and now it's the first reporting year that we're going to have to report separately for both programs. So now we have EU ETS and UK ETS that are simultaneously going on. Uh, the reporting season is upon us, uh, uh, which mar with March 31st as the reporting deadline for uh, most of EU ETS and UK ETS. I'll say most of ETS because there are some random uh, reporting deadlines out there. For example, Spain requires on EU ETS a March 15th deadline uh, for that reporting. Uh, afterwards, just because of the nature of how the program works, then we go into the uh, carbon offsetting, which has an April 30th deadline. And uh, obviously, uh, before we can do that portion of it, we have to do the report. Uh, and although most operators are currently exempt from having to report for one of both these programs, uh, we still need to look really closely at the operations for 2021 to be able to determine if that exemption exists for the reporting year. Uh, like previous years, the threshold remains the same for EU ETS of 1,000 tons of CO2. Uh, and if you fall below that threshold, you are not required to report for EU ETS. Uh, very similarly, uh, UK ETS falls under those thresholds as well. Uh, so if you are reporting for EU ETS and you've had operations into the UK, uh, for 2021, then we are obligated to report for both programs. Uh, so it go hand in hand, and they do have to, um, you know, they work together with each other, but they are separate programs that we need to submit separate reports, do separate surrender of carbon credits. So uh, they are tied together, but again, different programs. Um, and for those of you that are exempt for 2021, um, very good, but we know that 2022 uh, operations are picking up. 
So maybe you aren't reporting this year for last year, uh, but in 2023, we definitely need to look at 2022 and see how those operations were uh, because the process is gonna be the same. Um, so that's a high level overview of what we'll be covering uh, with Adam, uh, Rick and Chris here, uh, but I'll be monitoring the chat as well. So feel free to drop in any questions that you have. If you have questions particularly about your operation and you don't want to drop them in the general chat, you can chat, uh, send me a message directly. I can look into your operation specifically and answer any questions that you might have. So uh, just feel free to uh, either drop your questions in the chat in the general box or directly to me, or just um, you know ask Adam while we're going through the presentation. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Adam to go forward with what we're covering today. Thanks a lot, Juan. Hey, uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for uh, attending today. You know, as as uh, well, as I told the group before we got on, most important to me, especially, uh, is that our clients uh, know that we're uh, on top of these complicated uh, requirements. That uh, we're we're working through our process and in line with deadlines. Uh, and everybody's kind of you know well in hand uh, as we take on these new challenges uh, in global emissions, and that's. Nothing new uh, if you've been around uh, EU ETS or, or these programs uh, for any kind of time, you realize that we've been been adapting uh, and changing you know, over this last uh, decade as requirements change. One, like we talked about four or five months ago, uh, and Juan just made clear, UK ETS is uh, you know, a, a carbon copy, uh, for lack of a better term, of EU ETS. It has uh, just with different uh, different regional scope for full, uh, you know, for your requirements. So for your thresholds, your full scopes, uh, and and what your applicable activity would be. So we, if for, for some operators, we have one uh, that we're reporting on. Some were reporting on both, or some were were exempt in both. Uh, as you know, the process first uh, that you've all seen is getting the information from Eurocontrol. Eurocontrol does manage uh, UK's airspace uh, still, even after Brexit. Uh, so the, the data file uh, coming from Euro Control is uh, still 100% valid for both UK ETS and EU ETS. Uh, we can only use it for a portion, obviously, of Corsia uh, oh, and, and Swiss ETS, as well as captured uh, within that Euro Control report. Uh, Corsia obviously only captures a piece of it, Corsia being the applicable program uh, for operators uh, for all international flights uh, from, from country A to country B. Uh, and really is a, you know, a tertiary uh, kind of requirement right now, uh, a little bit on, on the sidelines, uh, but something that we're, we're rapidly uh, uh, accelerating on. We do have a few uh, very large operators that have to uh, comply with Corsia this year, but uh, the vast, vast majority of, of operators are uh, exempt from Corsia. So uh, we've got these duplicate kind of duplicate lanes going with UK ETS and EU ETS. We've requested uh, Euro control reports for all operators based on our data that uh, we think are anywhere near the, the threshold that, that need uh, attention uh, because those reports are, you know, cost money. They're 400 euros a piece. Uh, unless an op if an operator is well, well below the threshold, uh, if they don't, uh, require and we're and we're confident based on our flight data that that they're nowhere close to the threshold. We don't request those reports. If uh, what I would like to know, I would like to say that I know sustainability programs are growing uh, within within uh, different flight departments. And if you want those records, if you want uh, clear records of uh, exemptions, those kind of things, uh, we can obviously request those and push it out to you or even just a note uh, directly from Universal, uh, which we do a lot of that. We do a lot of notifications of exemptions, uh, but uh, I think the way that we're moving as an industry is that you'd want, uh, everybody wants a validation. So if you're, if you're exempt, you want that validated by the professionals. If you're not, uh, you want the report completed. A uh, couple of notes that came into the chat here. Uh, does do UK EU flight count allowances? So uh, allowances uh, for UK and EU ETS are going to be separate. Uh, you'll have two different buckets. You'll have UK allowances and EU uh, allowances when we offset. And Chris and Rick can talk a little bit more about allowances uh, here in a minute. 
Uh, the exemption threshold for Corsia that, that Nate threw in there uh, is 10,000 tons of, of CO2. So, uh, and it's on only on those international routes. So no U.S. domestic travel is counted. No domestic travel within any countries uh, globally is counted. And that's that's what keeps most uh, private operators uh, under those under those thresholds. Uh, struggles. So you know there is there is uh, new regulators in the UK. I think they've really staffed up to try to try to work through this. So uh, we are seeing some pushback on things that that uh, are really kind of detailed or in the weeds uh, from the UK authorities. So we're we're working really hard to uh, push through those. Uh, but a lot of it is just familiarity, I think, uh, as much as, as anything. Uh, our deadline's coming up. We have, Juan mentioned Spain has already passed. We had our operator in Spain that we've already submitted. Uh, and our next, uh, next dates coming up are uh, March 31st for us, for both UK and EU ETS and Corsia uh, to uh, report uh, the, the annual activity for operators who are over the thresholds. We've, we've identified who those people are. Uh, we've engaged many of them uh, in, in a data validation. If we have questions, if we have questions on your account, we will definitely reach out to you to confirm the data from Eurocontrol before it goes into, uh, into the reporting system, whether that's the UK with their ET swap system uh, or other countries that will be submitting uh, via email. So you can, we will push that to you as an operator. We will bring that to you. We will, you don't have to question us uh, regarding data validation. If we're, if we're confident and we have good data that matches a uh, universal system uh, and historical, historical confirmation, we may just move forward. But uh, data validation is where we're at right now. Uh, the completion of AE reports through uh, whatever format your country is wanting. We do have an, a, another uh, operator who's assigned to Ireland that has created their own portal outside of ET Swap. So we'll be working with them uh, over the next few days to finalize that piece. Uh, but more than anything, that's really what what uh, what has slowed us down this year a little bit is just kind of a, uh, the new program uh, being on the landscape, new regulators that we're working with, uh, and, and these new requirements uh, are just making it a, a little bit of a struggle. But uh, here in early March, I think we're well positioned uh, to meet deadlines for, for all operators. Uh, I, I do. I, I want to just uh, mention something right quick. Adam did mention about uh, we've engaged uh, pretty much every operator out there that uh, we see fit that is going to have reporting requirements. Uh, if you believe that you are maybe close to that threshold, keep in mind that we're basing the information uh, mostly from our system. So if you do operations outside of uh, using Universal for your flight planning uh, or uh, trip management, uh, we really do encourage you to go into our uh, portal, our global emissions portal, uh, to ensure that all your uh, air operations are captured. Uh, we were only as good as the information that's there to determine who is going to uh, be applicable for reporting. So uh, if you feel that you're close to that threshold of 1,000 tons for EU ETS, um, really recommend going into that global emissions portal if you need instructions again on how to go about it. Uh, shoot us an email, send it in the chat. Uh, we'll give you the instructions on how to access the portal to ensure that we have uh, the, the, you know, captured all your operations for 2021. Yeah, uh, yeah, it lines up uh, certainly with, with what we said. Whether, whether you think you're from the threshold or near the threshold and you haven't heard from us, you want to know what your actual number is for the year, you need an official, you want an official exemption, you want uh, absolutely uh, you know, reach out to us. Uh, a lot of that stuff is still going to be coming. Exemptions, we'll work through a lot of those as we finish out the reporting season and make a lot uh, make a lot of notifications around exemptions. You see some of those coming out from the member states directly, uh, where we've already addressed it directly with them, and so they're reporting back out to the operator. So you'll see some of those uh, come across. Uh, but really, our timeline to notify regarding exemptions would be closer to our reporting uh, reporting dates, which would be the end of March. Uh, once we report and we have a good idea of how many uh, carbon allowances an operator is going to need for each program, which is detailed specifically in the Euro Control Report, these are not we're not having to make guesses or or any other calculations. 
uh, Euro control, as long as we give them the proper fleet information, can calculate uh, that intra uh, intra UK or intra EU offsets. Uh, just to talk about offsets real quick, and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chris and Rick to talk about their the setup process they're going through. The offsets and allowances have, I think, 4x, 3x, 4x, something like that during the pandemic. So I think the last time, uh, a few years ago, they were closer to 30 euro or 25 euro. Uh, now we're at uh, around 80 euro or 90 euro per carbon allowance. Uh, so it's a it's a pretty uh, pretty steep cost now. Uh, and we had talked before about the administration kind of trumping the, the cost of, of allowances. That's really not going to be the case anymore, especially for an operator who has any kind of significant uh, surrender that they're going to be required to do. It is, it is going to be expensive. And so we, we want to make sure that you guys are, are thinking about that or reporting it kind of up the chain. Uh, so as part of the information, this, I'm going to send out the current price of allowances after this to, to everybody, just so you can start doing uh, some, some mental math on what, uh, what the bill is going to look like in, uh, at the end of April. Uh, one, one more thing, or actually, actually, before I get into that stuff, let's, let's turn it over to Chris and, and Rick for a second. Uh, so, uh, Chris and Rick, Chris Johnson and Rick Cortez with, uh, Aviation Emissions Solutions based over in the UK. Uh, Universal has been partnered with, the, with these guys for several years now. Uh, they manage a, a lot of, uh, accounts for us for, you know, fortune, fortune 100 companies trusted partners uh, take over that uh, authorized representation and legal representation for operators that can be so uh, so bothersome and so personal when they're asking for for the type of information they're asking for to set up these accounts. But Chris, uh, maybe I'll just take a step back with you for a second. Talk to us about uh, aircraft operator holding accounts, just, uh, just a quick general, what they are, uh, why we need them, and, and why we need two of them this year. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, just uh, to pick up on what Adam was saying there. Uh, yeah, I'm Chris Johnson. I work for AES Limited in the UK. We've been working with Universal for well, seven, seven or eight years now, I think. <clears throat> and um, nice. we work in the emissions reporting and compliance side, but mainly on the on the registry account side for uh, for Universal. And um, just give you a brief taste of, of the sort of things that are keeping us busy in the last three or four months. And it's mainly revolving around opening of the accounts and the AOHAs. Um, just a, a brief recap, as a result of, of the Brexit process, as you're, I'm sure you're all aware, the UK is no, no longer part of Europe. So we're no longer part of the EU ECHS process. So as a result, the EU ECHS has, has, has removed the, essentially the UK flights from, from, from that process, but the UK have created their own um, emission scheme. And this is where you, 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 you report your flights from the UK outwards. And as, as a result of that, the UK have, have demanded that you need to uh, create your own uh, um, registry account, as well as the one that you have in Europe. You now need an additional one in the UK. So if you were previously assigned to the UK, you may well have been migrated to Europe. And from what we've seen, the vast majority of the operators that have been migrated have been moved to France. And that's based on the fact that uh, the criteria they use is, is dependent upon what country you overfly the most. And so if you, it, previously it was probably the UK. It may still be the UK, but for Europe, it will now be France. And you, and you will need another account in, Europe, in, uh, in the UK, assuming that you do make the occasional flight to, to the UK. Um, one of the things that uh, that we've been we've been coming across that's really causing us problems, and that's um, the UK is generally pretty helpful to, to when we're getting the accounts up and running. And there's an initial process where you provide a, a, an amount of documentation, and the account is is sort of semi-opened. But then they start asking for additional documents. And one of the things that they do ask for is um, is, is a document called the Primary Contact Appointment and Declaration Form, which is such as shortened to the PCAD form. And that requests um, a couple of names to go in there, just essentially to validate the fact that the information is coming from the operator and the fact that they're happy for us to work on their behalf to, to, to manage their registry account for them. And that's always accepted very, very quickly within the UK. But then after that, you then get a, an accompanying email several weeks later to say, we need those guys' names. 
that were specified in that PCAD form, they need to, those signatories need to be authorised. And that's causing us some issues because they really don't really accept any authorization for those guys um, at anything below director level. So for even the big companies, obviously that, that creates a bit of an issue because you need to get into those guys' diaries just to get a simple form, form um, you know, signed to say that these guys can represent the company and they can sign on behalf of us to say that we can then represent them within the registry. So that's causing us a few little issues at the moment. We've, we've got a few ways around it and we're working away with that, but that's probably causing us most of the hassles at the moment. Um, we're get, certainly getting accounts open up and running in, in France and Spain and Finland. We've got a few other countries that... Uh, that operators have been assigned to, but um, that's been the, the, the biggest sort of, I suppose, thorn in our side is, is trying to get that signatory authorization. That's what we're sort of working our way around at the moment. Aside from that, I think business as usual, uh, we're playing on. We've, we've got quite a few of the accounts already in and running now. We've got the, quite a few le left to do, just residual stuff. Most of them have, we've started on the process. Uh, we've, been, we've been hindered a fair amount by... Um, no information is, is, is being put out by the uh, UK Environment Agency until such time as the EMP plan has been approved. And so, as Adam touched on earlier on, that, that stuff takes time. So that's halted us, halted us to a degree, but we're, near, we're, we're very close to being there now. So we're, we're well on the way to getting you know, 80 to 90 percent of the accounts there. I think that's probably all I want to speak about at the moment. Um, Rick, I'm not sure if you've got any, anything else to add, or if not, I'll, I'll hand over to Rick and he can do a, a, a small amount about the um, about the uh, emissions of carbon credits and that side of, of, of the uh, of the process. Yeah, just to, just to add what you're saying there, Chris, um, the fact that the rules are essentially the same for setting up accounts, but going to different registries, uh, different content authorities within Europe, uh, we find that although the rules are essentially the same, uh, they're interpreted differently by different authorities. So the documentation that one authority might require, um, it might be something different from another. So there's, there's not complete consistency across the board. So that, that gives an added flavour to the whole process, really. Um, but yeah, moving on from there, um, Chris, if you, you're finished on your end. Yep. Um, yeah, my name is Rick Cordes, um, Chris's colleague. I've been working with Adam and his fine team over in Houston for, for a good number of years now. And um, we've been working together to, to take care of you guys so that it minimises the trauma. Um, the rules are constantly changing, uh, shifting sands, and it's the, you know part of the challenge is actually staying abreast with where all, all this, this is going, particularly now we've got you know, several systems uh, on the go. Uh, but I'd just like to speak um, you know, very briefly about um, carbon credits and where we are with the prices. I know Adam touched on the prices a bit earlier on, uh, but we actually got uh, from the coalface update earlier on um, uh, from somebody uh, in Europe. And so we've got the very latest. Um, but you guys probably remember uh, the good old days back 10 years ago when carbon credits were only around four euros, three to four euros each. Um, now, that's obviously changed now. And um, the, the prices have gone up tremendously. Uh, they hit a height of just under 100 euros. Um, uh, earlier on uh, this year, late last year, earlier on this year. Um, but what's happened since then is because of the turmoil and the upset from the crisis in Ukraine, um, there's been a lot of volatility in very recent times. Um, the biggest fall that, um, you know, one day fall that was seen in the market was in fact yesterday, and there was a 20% drop uh, in prices. Um, so, you know, it came from that height of, you know, getting off 100 euros, uh, which was about you know, $110 or so, uh, down to what it is um, on today's prices. So for the European Union allowances, that's the EUAs, um, we're looking at um, just under 70 euros per carbon credit. Uh, that equates to around about, you know, $75, $76 uh, per carbon credit. Um, for the separate UK system, uh, as it, or the guys have been saying earlier on, the two systems are separate, although they're essentially very similar in many respects. Um, the UK price, the latest we've got on that was £73 per carbon credit, and that equates to you know, getting off for of $95. Um, so, yeah, from that low base 10 years ago of three to four 
um, euros, which was pretty similar in dollars at that time from my recollection, uh, we're now up uh, substantially more. Uh, but there's been a bit of a lull in the prices due to the, the turbulence that's been in the market, you know, as a result of the, the, the situation in Ukraine. Um, I think even Poland, uh, they, they um, asked for the, uh, the ETS, the EU ETS to be postponed. Uh, but I think the chances of that are extremely remote. So, um, but um, yeah, that's where we are at the moment, guys. Um, it's not quite the, the height it was earlier on, um, up at, towards the hundred mark. But um, it, it's still it's still pretty high up there for the moment. Um, so yeah, that's that's about it from me. Um, I'll hand you back to Adam uh, and Juan for now. Thank you. Thanks, Chris and, and Rick. I really appreciate that insight on, on AOHAs, aircraft holding accounts, registry accounts. Anytime you see those terms or hear those terms, I'm talking about the same thing. If I say registry account, if I say AOHA, I'm talking about the exact same thing, the account that you have to set up to manage uh, a carbon allowance. A carbon allowance is a, is a financial commodity. And so instead of being able to just pay your bill, you have to buy this financial commodity and then surrender it. So that's it's, it's really a long way around of, of turning in uh, a lot of money for, uh, for the tax. But uh, in any case, I really appreciate you guys uh, talking about that. I, the delay is interesting. We actually have a couple of operators you've seen. I, I know uh, they may be on the call where the UK has requested a delay in uh, reviewing their annual emissions monitoring plan. I, again, I don't think that's going to hurt the operator or change anything. It just shows the kind of backlog that the regulator is experiencing where they're saying they can't even deal with it at the moment and that they're gonna move the, the process forward without an official uh, approval on the AEM. But uh, just kind of showing the challenges that, that we're all facing uh, as we try to uh, deal with these two, uh, two, three, four programs that are out there. Uh, I, I answered a couple of questions in the chat uh, about uh, applicability, flights from the UK to the, to the EU, flights from the EU to the UK. You know, one, one direction belongs to one program, one direction or the other direction belongs to the other. It's really about where you're departing from in this, in this case. Uh, but don't see any other, other questions in the chat. I, uh, that's really what we had to, to share with you guys. Uh, really quick, 25, 30 minute update let you know that we're, we're on pace, uh, that we understand the challenges here, uh, that we've got the right people in place, we've got the resources, we've got the experts, uh, and we're well on our way. Um, Adam, one, one question that I yeah. have that I, I wanted to run about you before I answered it, but um, if an operator knows that they are below that threshold and they don't apply for having to report in 2021, do they have to take any action uh, for, uh, for that? Technically, no. And so there's a couple of scenarios here, right? So uh, if somebody has, is exempt for 2021, uh, but they've operated uh, previously, right? Or they've, they've crossed over those thresholds previously and they think they're going, they may need to comply in the future. Uh, you know, the exemption as far as the report is one thing, but whether or not they should go ahead and set up registry accounts, all those kind of things really depends on your uh, kind of historical footprint and what you think you're going to do going forward. Because we do have operators who are exempt for this year, but maybe taking advantage of a of an AOHA transfer process where they're able to set up their registry account for a, a lower cost or an easier process uh, than they would be able to do it if they delayed until next year. So there's a couple of interesting scenarios where somebody may be exempt, but uh, it's in their best interest to continue uh, the administration, especially in this UK EU thing, right? So because they've They've split that footprint a little bit. And because we still have reduced footprint uh, from people due to COVID, obviously now uh, 2022, Europe's going to be a little bit reduced based on uh, the geopolitical that's, ha that's happening over there. Uh, but if you're a historical reporter, if you're historically going over those thresholds, moving forward to establish the infrastructure like registry accounts uh, is, a, is a good idea in, in some scenarios. But the, but the the short answer to I'm I am below the threshold. What do I have to do? The technical answer is nothing. The the best practice is to validate that, confirm it with the regulator, and make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, that the data that that has earned that exemption uh, is correct. Remember, uh, 
a member state will only issue an exemption based on what they get from Euro control. Euro control will not automatically update your fleet for things like EU ETS just because you file flight plans in the EU. If you take on or, or you know, on board or off board, off board, I don't think that's a term, <laughs> <laughs> on board or offload an aircraft from your fleet, uh, you know, GRS and regulatory services, EU, the global emissions team need to be copied on that so that we continue, so that we keep Euro control up to pace with your active fleet. Uh, if Euro control doesn't have your fleet and you're over the threshold, but don't know it, you're still responsible. All right. So it's, and, you know, having that backstop, having Euro control as a backstop for EU ETS and UK ETS is, is an amazing resource because we don't have to calculate everything for ourselves, right? They're, they're giving it to us. We just have to give them the right parameters and the right fleet. Uh, so I would leave in this call. One, one takeaway is examine what you, what you have communicated to Universal as far as fleet list. If there's been any changes recently, certainly send that stuff to us. Uh, but we are actively asking those questions when we're doing data validation. So if, we're, if we, we're looking at our system, we're looking at our emails, we're looking at all those communications with the client to detect uh, whether your control has the, has the right story. Cool. Long and short answer to that question. Sorry, Juan. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, you, know, you know me, brother. No, no, no. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but, but with that, uh, that's really what we had to share. Uh, I really appreciate that follow-up, Juan. Uh, I'll open it up to the floor uh, for any other questions. And again, if you, after this meeting, if anyone has anything else, you can reach out to us. As Annabelle mentioned, I will be uh, attending the IOC conference here in not even a couple of weeks, so like a week and a half. Yeah. So if anything right. comes up at that moment, well, we, I'll be able to answer any questions. And uh, we actually will have a, um, a room, right, Annabelle, that we can actually yes, go in and Yes, there is a place you can process. come find us. You don't have to just chase Juan around the conference. Uh, <laughs> you can come find him uh, when he's not speaking. So your session is Monday, correct? It actually got moved to Wednesday. It got moved to Wednesday. I didn't yeah. see that. Okay, no, well, breaking yeah. news right here, uh, the update <laughs> to the IOC schedule. Okay, well, we will update that in our information. But yeah, to answer Juan's question, and again, to just remind everyone, first of all, thank you very much, Adam, Juan, Rick and Chris, of course, for the quick update, much, much appreciated, I know, by all of our listeners and viewers. Uh, but so for us, yes, if you do are going to be in Los Angeles for IOC, you can come see us. We have a hospitality and demo suite at IOC. That's the Beverly Room. We're going to be right around the corner from the main general session ha hall that is taking there at the Westin. So please definitely come see us and all of our team of experts. You know, we always try to bring uh, from all parts of the organization so that you have a chance to meet in uh, uh, privately with and have some discussions with members of our team, both operations uh, and your account managers. So definitely send us a note if you have, if you're coming so we can get you hooked up with the right people. Um, and speaking of notes, uh, everyone should have that uh, and I know you you probably talk to Juan and Adam more than I do, which is impressive. But uh, that EU ETS email is a great way uh, to get in touch with the group. And that way, if you need an answer, they're going to be able to answer that way. And I think from the and standpoint of, since we have any other questions pop in while we were chatting. No, nope. and you and you can EU ETS is a catch all for our global emissions. So if you if you, you know, if it's re regarding UK ETS or whatever, you can just send it to that okay. same address. I, we decided not to create a, a third and fourth address that leads to, to the same place. Uh, All the uh, and, same experts. <laughs> and, and we will we'll also be in uh, San Diego in April. Uh, and I'm actually, I'm hosting a sustainability session there with the uh, sustainability pan or sustainability committee from uh, NBAA and Juan will be uh, on that panel as well. So if you're in San Diego, come see us. Excellent. Yeah, we'll be we'll be across California here really soon. So hopefully we'll get a chance to see many of you and other members of your team. Well, again, thank you for joining us. If you have, I will be sending out or members of our team will be sending out a link to this video. So there's anyone else in your organization that could not make it and you want to make sure they see this, we'll let, make that accessible as well as to other members of the 
uh, emission subscriber base that weren't able to make it today as well. So much appreciate everyone's time. Thank you. And we will see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.